inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. I've got a really interesting two-part series. So this week on the show, we're going to talk to an investor that invests for cash flow. He's not too concerned about his properties appreciating in value. He wants to buy properties that are going to produce good, steady, stable cash flow. And he's done just that. His his properties enabled him to leave his job, and today the rentals support him and his family. And I think that's awesome. Next week on the show, we're going to talk to an investor that has a completely different approach. He invests for appreciation. His properties don't really produce that much cash flow, but he's built a ton of wealth by investing for appreciation. So I I think it'll be interesting to listen to how two people can be so successful in this business, but have two totally different approaches. So this week, we're going to meet Mark Owens. He's an investor from Baltimore, Maryland, and he has done an incredible job of building his portfolio. We're going to kind of walk through how he did it. Um, He started using down payments, and then he figured out he didn't need to use down payments to buy rental property. So we're going to hear how he did that. He's also going to share some really good landlording tips. He, He does a great job managing his properties, and he's going to share how he does it. So let's take a real quick break. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll meet Mark. Are you on track to achieve your financial goals? Income producing real estate is the most historically proven way to accumulate wealth and has created more financial freedom than any other means. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best turnkey cash flow rental properties. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly income. Get your free strategy session with our knowledgeable investment counselors at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Hey, Mark. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm on the right podcast because rental income is the name of the game. And uh, that is what it was all about for me. So I'm I'm definitely at the right place. Thanks for having me. Sure. So tell us about where you're at today, and then we'll we'll take a step back and see how you got started. But tell us about your portfolio today. Sure. Uh, as you know, I started about 15, a little over 15 years ago. Uh, I started out, I just bought a three unit with a garage. And today I've got over a hundred units that I own personally. Uh, and then I have another partnership with someone else where I own, I think another 15 or 16 units. And what's incredible is that you just started from scratch. I mean, you didn't have a million dollars when you got started. I mean, you just basically built this one house at a time. Yeah, when I started, there were no, uh, there was no Facebook, there was no Craigslist, there was no. Uh, I mean, it's hard for people to believe today, but none of that was there. There were no, there was no Meetup.com. There were a couple of RIAs that I, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, when I first started, I think I'd read a couple of books that I got at, you know, Borders Bookstore, which is gone. And I don't even think Amazon was around 15 years ago. But I, yeah, I just started with a couple of books that I read and a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. That's incredible. So, so tell me about your first deal. The first deal, let me back up and just tell you yeah. what motivated me to find my first yeah. deal. I was making, I was in the IT business uh, at the time and I was making really good money at the time. It was between 130 and 150 a year as an independent consultant. And I'd only been doing that for a couple of years and I didn't know, you know how long it was going to last. Something told me it wasn't going to last forever. And I needed, and I was a 1099 person. So if I got hurt, got sick, yeah, I wasn't going to get paid. So I just, I thought I need to figure out a way where I can take the money that I'm making and invest it in something so that in the event that I can't work, I've got enough income coming in to cover my bare basic minimum uh, living expenses. Cause at the time my wife wasn't working. She, we had had a newborn son and, and she was going back to school full time. So we were, you know, the family was depending on me for income. So I thought, this rental property thing sounds like a good safety net. If I can buy some rentals that are making maybe, you know, after all my expenses, two, three, four hundred dollars a month, and I can get 10 or 15 of them, maybe 20 of them, then I'm going to have enough money where in the event something happens and I'm not able to work that I can still continue to pay, you know, take care of my family. So that's, that's what motivated me to start Uh, at the time. You know, I was surfing around the internet looking for houses. And at the time, in 2002, a good deal that fit my profile, if I could buy a house for 50000 that rented out for $800 a month, that was a really good deal. And those were really hard to find. The mm-hmm. first one I found 
was in a neighborhood that I was very familiar with. I grew up there, uh, Hamden in Baltimore City. It was a three unit with a large garage in the back. It was listed for 75000 and And uh, I ended up meeting with a real estate agent, the guy that listed it. And uh, I bought it. And it was a roach infested. It was, it was nasty. It was dirty. I wasn't looking, you know, there wasn't a spot on my spreadsheets for nasty and dirty and roaches. <laughs> my, it was just numbers. And I thought, you know, I can, you know, this is something that an exterminator can take care of this. And, uh, and so that's how I found my first property. W- was it hard to find the, the, your first contractors that were helping you get that place ready to go? <laughs> it was the hardest part. <laughs> the, uh, when I bought it, it was turnkey. And uh-huh. at the time I was looking for turnkey because I didn't have anybody to do the work. And there were times, you know, as the months went by where I would find myself, I would get off work at 10 at night. I'd finish teaching a class at some college. I'd get to the property at 1030. I'd paint till 1, 1 1.30 in the morning. And then I would teach another class, you know, the next day, all day and in the evening. And then it was just, you know, talking to people, talking to neighbors, talking to friends. And, uh, you know, a lot of trial and error. You know, you find a painter and he shows up at eight o'clock in the morning and he's already, you know, he's already drinking a beer and he hasn't even started painting yet. He's already, you walk in your house and you catch him drinking in the house at eight o'clock in the morning. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But it's a lot of trial and error in the beginning. And then I didn't know anybody. So I didn't, I didn't know any other landlords. So it was really difficult. Uh, So you had to really just kind of figure everything out on your own as far as. Yep, like knowing how to operate the party, the, the the property, and and yeah, how to screen tenants and do leases and all that. So you you figured that out. How long did it take you to buy your next property? I was on a roll. I I probably bought my first property within the next uh, two months. Wow, wow, that's and incredible. Then another one two months after that. I think I was in the first year. I think I was up to maybe five or six buildings, maybe you know, a dozen units in the back of your mind, were you thinking, well, maybe I should see if this works before I buy more or were you just all in, Hey, I'm going to make this work. I was all in. And again, but you know, I was letting the numbers do my thinking for me. I was taking the emotions out of it Mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, I put together this Excel spreadsheet that showed me my cash on cash return on my investment. That's all I cared about. If I'm going to come out of pocket with $10,000, then I need to make three thousand a year. I had thirty percent cash on cash return was my target. Okay, that, that's what I needed to make the deal work, and, and uh, that that's all I cared about. Now, it, since you're you're just getting started and you, you don't have a lot of other landlords to help you in the right direction, were you w- with your estimations? W- were you right on with how much maintenance was going to cost or? when a tenant moved out, how much it would cost you to turn over a property. What were you right on with those, those estimates or were you off? In the beginning I was, uh, I was off and I'm still off. I still usually think a little bit more enthusiastic. You know, mm-hmm. the, the reality is usually a little bit, uh, harder than, yeah, you know, I, I have a very positive rosy outlook. So I think, okay, this is going to cost 2000 and it usually ends up costing 2,500 or 3000. Okay. Okay. But that, but, but I have enough cushion built in where it doesn't even matter. Uh, and I have enough income off of, you know, my properties and off the job that I had back then to cover if I, you know, right. Okay. Okay. Then then I always had the cushion to to take care of it. Now, how about financing? I I know back then that the, the banks had different standards. You you didn't need as much down today. Banks typically want you to put 20% down. Was it, less back then of a down payment you needed or was it still about 20 percent that you needed it, it that's a really good question uh it was back then it was 10 percent down and you pay all the closing costs but back then i was very limited with my knowledge so i didn't i'd never heard of hard money i had no idea what hard money was mm-hmm. uh I, I would see we buy houses signs on telephone poles and i didn't even know what that was i, mean, I had no clue i was right. just i was just a guy buying properties to rent out go into the regular banks. And I mean, since then I've learned a lot more strategies. If, if I went back 15 years with what I know now, I would have, I would have killed it. I mean, I would have done much better, much faster because I had the knowledge that, that I didn't have then. So like what, what specifically would you be doing differently? Would you not be getting that traditional bank financing? 
I would, you know, you can do that if you've got the money, but if you don't have the money, then the easiest way to do it is to find a house that's vacant, that needs some, you know, some work. And you use private money or hard money to purchase the property, fix it up, get it rented out, and then refi out, pay your hard money lender back. And most of the time, you can do that with very little, if any, money out of your pocket. I've done that with, I mean, I've bought, you know, fairly large apartment buildings, 10, 12, 15, 18, 13, 14 unit buildings with no money out of my pocket. And I did it following that technique. And uh, I, I think that is the greatest way to, to buy rental properties. I know we kind of went through that pretty quickly. Let's dive into that a little bit so people can see exactly how this works. So you're buying a property that's that's beat up, needs a lot of work, and you're buying it for way under market value, right? That's yeah, kind me, of the first let's, step. Let's do a single, let's do a single family yeah. house uh, in a blue collar neighborhood to start with, because that's something that's in every community in America. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, most communities. So we can, Start. Let's, and I'm going to use some simple numbers, uh, just so the math's easy to do, you know, on our head, mm-hmm. in our head. So let's say that you find a neighborhood where the average, you know, after repair value is a hundred thousand dollars. In in Baltimore City, you might say Bel Air Edison, hundred thousand dollar property after it's fixed up. So a wholesaler or a listing agent says, "Hey, there's a Aria that just hit the market for." $73,000. It's a fixer upper. You go take a look at it and you're like, yeah, it is a fixer upper. It needs 73 for the purchase. Uh, maybe it needs 10,000 to, to fix it up, paint carpet and some cabinets. So that brings you up to 83. Those numbers might be a little bit tight. Uh, if you bought that house with hard money and you renovated it, maybe you're all in it for 85 with your purchase costs and all. Once you get it the tenant in there and get it stabilized, you could refi out. If a bank says, well, look, we'll do 80% LTV, that's 80,000 you're going to get back. You're still going to owe your hard money lender another five maybe. Mm-hmm. So you want to look for deals that are a little bit better than that. But that's pretty much the technique. And it's the same formula that the rehabbers use. Right. You're going to want to take like 70% or 65% of the after repair value, subtract your repair costs, and then that's what you want to pay for the house. And mm-hmm. then you should be able to refi it, assuming that you have good credit. You right. should be able to refi out of it. I've done that many, many times with single family homes, uh, mixed use properties, larger multifamily properties. I've got several friends, some, some are new investors uh, that have been doing this less than a couple of years that have done it where they've bought 20 houses in the last uh, two years. And, and they've used that technique. That technique is really kind of how you you were able to to go from having a, a few rentals to having a lot because you didn't need to have those 10% down payments on That's every correct. property. Yep. That's incredible. And now, and now the banks went 20 or 25. So, mm-hmm. and that's one, one of the things I like to clarify all the time is people say, well, how many units do you have? Or how many, how many buildings do you have? And somebody might say, well, I've, you know, I got five properties. And then you find out each property has 10 apartments in it. Right. right. That's right. completely different. Right scenario, and what it does is the you know with the larger buildings, a lot of times the financing is easier because the commercial loans they look more at the building than the person. Mm-hmm. But in the beginning, I wouldn't focus on the larger buildings. I would focus on the single family homes because they cash flow better. People don't know that, but with uh, apartments, there's more of a transient population. You got a lot more turnovers to deal with. You have problems with you know tenants saying, oh, his radio is too loud. He plays at two in the morning, and you're dealing with a lot of that stuff. We have to come in and try to you know settle things out. Single family homes, they they're cheaper, they cash flow better, they're easier to sell in the event that you want to sell one. Uh, and you know, door you know for every dollar you spend on the single families, you're going to make more than you will in the multi families. Right. Now th- you were 42 when you retired. From your from your job, how many um, how many units were you up to at that point? I think I we're going back now. That was around two thousand six, two thousand seven. I think I had around thirty five units. Okay, and at, at that point, what were the units? What, these were all single families. No, I had some. I had uh, some uh, started getting into the larger apartment buildings. I think I had one fifteen unit mixed use building that was eight apartments and seven commercial spaces by that time. Okay. And that was when I bought that the eight apartments were all vacant. I used hard money for the purchase. 
and, you know, renovation, filled it with tenants, refied out, paid my hard money lender back. And that's, that was like the first big building that I did. But uh, as I said before, the money's really in the single families. You don't want to large, you don't want to deal with a bigger building until you've got, got a bunch of smaller ones under your belt. Right. Okay. So today with over a hundred units, let's talk about the management and how you manage these properties. Does it take you all day? Is this basically a full-time job trying to keep up with a hundred tenants? <laughs> the, no, it's not the, my, I have a full-time job like being available, but I get very few calls. I mean, I maybe, I mean, there, it's funny when I get, I'll go on vacation for a week and I might get three phone calls the whole week that somebody else takes for me. Wow. Uh, and then sometimes I might get three calls in a day. It's just there's no consistency to it. But I've got a bunch of systems set up that make it that make my life really easy. And uh, and they took years to develop. And this wasn't something I didn't read in the book. It wasn't something where I just said, okay, this is what I'm going to do to make my life simple. What I did is every time I had to do something especially things I don't like. I think, is there another way to do that? Is there a better way? Is there a more efficient way? Is there a faster way? If I get a ground rent bill, for instance, many people aren't familiar with that, but it's a kind of a Baltimore thing where I have to pay this bill every six months, pay a year in advance. I mean, it's just, I'm cutting the amount Mm -hmm. of checks I have to write in half just by doing that. Right. Uh, I set up all of my utilities for budget billing and auto pay. Uh, You know, one property, I have to I have it's a oil fired furnace for a three unit building that's that I pay for the oil. And so what happens is you get these big oil bills in the winter and then the summer you're just sitting around doing nothing. I called the oil and you know you gotta write the checks in the winter. So I called the oil company a few months ago and I said, you know, do you guys do budget building? I want to start making payments in the summer to kind of level out my cash flow. And they said, sure, we do budget billing. And I said, do you can I set up auto pay? And they said, sure, we can set up auto pay. So I just did that a few months ago after writing checks for 10 years. <laughs> and, now, and now they take $230 a month, every month out of my checking account and I don't have to do anything. And so in my, you know, my budget is, is a more level. <clears throat> it's less work that I have to do. So again, it's just identifying these things that you do that you don't like to do and trying to find another way to do it. Right. And, that, and that's how, and that's my strategy with all of it. How do you keep track of all the rent checks? I mean, with over 100 people paying you every month, how do you know that everyone's paid you? I, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm old school. I use Excel. I love Excel. If I were starting all over again, I would probably use something like Buildium, mm-hmm. uh, which some of my friends use that they love. I use Excel. I love it. Of my residential units... Uh, about 65 to 70% of them are subsidized and I get direct deposit for a a big chunk of that. Uh, the, you know, before my feet hit the floor on the first of the month, the rent's already in the, in the bank. And, uh, you know, as I get the checks and this is another thing that I recently did, you know, I use a credit union and for when I get a check in the mail, I can just take a picture of it to deposit it. So I don't, I no longer have to go to the bank. Uh, so it's, So instead of going to the bank 15 times a month, now I go like once a month. And that's when I get a really big check. I can't deposit more than $10,000 in one check. Mm -hmm. And I get one rent check that's typically between $19,000 and $20,000 for one subsidized program. They don't do direct deposit. They send me this check. So I I have to go to the bank to deposit that. But with a check that big, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I use Excel to keep track of everything. And then, like, what about all the keys? I mean, you, you've got so many keys. How, how do you keep track of that? <laughs> I got a coffee can with a bunch of tags on it. <laughs> no, nah, I'm just uh, kidding. Okay, that, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how I started. You know, it's like you got, you know, a coffee can or a shoebox with a bunch of keys, and then, the, you know, the labels fall off, and you get them mixed up. And it was one of those things where I'm, I'm in Home Depot, and I'm, I, you know, getting a key made, and I – I see another customer come up to the key guy and he says, Hey, can you key these locks? So they use the same key. And the home Depot person said, sure, I can, I can do that. And then he pulled out this kit and I said, I'm my nosy, butt. I'm looking over the counter. I'm like, what is that? He's going to rekey these locks. What is it? And it was a quick set. I think two, seven, two is the name of the rekeying kit. Mm-hmm. The, Master key, I've distributed that to the people that have been working for me for years that I trust. 
and they all use it. And uh, it just makes my life a lot easier because I don't have to go around opening doors for people. That's all your, your contractors. So your HVAC contractor or your painter, they, they have the master key so they're not having to come to you to, to get the key to go into a property. Yep, that's correct. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so they all have the key. So if, if there's a maintenance problem that comes up, you can just send a text over to your handyman and then he can go over to the house and, and fix it. And that is exactly what happens. Uh, if I'm, you know, if I'm out of town and, you know, and a tenant gets locked out, I can, you know, call up one of the five guys that works for me full time and they don't just work for me full time. They also work for a couple of my friends. We share the guys and, uh, and my, all my friends, we all use the same master key. So if I'm driving around the city and one of their tenants gets locked out or they need to let an inspector in, you know, my key opens their units as well. That's awesome. Now, l- let's talk about that real quick because that, that's really smart. So you don't have enough work to keep someone busy uh, as a full-time job, but you've teamed up with some other investors and now you, you do have enough work between that everyone's properties. Yeah, it's kind of weird the way it worked is I think I was working on a larger building that I was renovating and I really liked the crew that I had and I wanted to find more work for them. So I had asked, uh, you know, some of my friends like, look, man, I'm going to be done this job in a couple of weeks and these, you know, I got these three guys that I need to keep busy and they're really good and I don't want to lose them. Do you have anything coming up? And they did. And then they moved from me at my job to their job. And then in the meantime, hey, I got a turnover. Let me grab the guys for a couple of days to, you know, get in here and, and paint this house and replace the, you know, the tubs around. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what we did. And it worked. And we've been doing it for close to 10 years now. Wow. Wow. That's really awesome. Now, th- tell me about your properties. Now, th- these are, uh, are, are they on the lower end? I would say some of them are, some aren't. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, I'm in the three to five range. Okay, the, so the threes and fours cash flow much better than the fives do. Uh, now, but the fives are, you know, easier to manage sometimes. A lot of people will say that they want to stay away from those areas and they maybe want to be in better areas because the tenants are easier to deal with. Is that true? Like, do you do you have a hard time dealing with your tenants? I don't, I don't really have a hard time dealing with my tenants, but the, the strategy that I use is probably different than a lot of people. Uh, I don't, I see my tenants as customers Mm -hmm. and I want to respond to their, you know, to their needs, you know, always and their wants occasionally. Uh, you know, if, if they have an issue, a maintenance issue, I take care of it. And, uh, you know, if it's a safety issue, it's, I'm going to take care of it immediately. Okay. Um, if they want something, if I can work it into the budget and they're a good tenant, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, turnovers can kill you. So one of the one of the tricks that I use is I will pay people to stay, and I also pay them to go. If they're bad tenants, I'll pay them to get out. So how uh, does that work? Like someone's just causing trouble, not paying rent. Like how how do you approach them and say I'm going to pay you to leave? Well, here's an example. Let's say that uh, tenants a couple months behind in rent or in rent court. You know, they're eviction. It's going to happen. It's imminent. Maybe it's uh, five weeks away. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to lose another five weeks of rent. Well, if I can convince them, like, look, you're going to be put out, you know, in five or six weeks. If you can be out by this Friday, I'll give you 200 bucks. Or by uh-huh. Sunday night, I'll give you $200. And I don't like doing that. But on the other hand, if it's going to save me $1,000, I can get right. the house rented out a month faster. It's it's in my financial best interest sure. to, to play like that. And I, on the other hand, if I got a good tenant that says, you know, hey, Mr. Mark, I'm, you know, I just want to let you know, I'm, I think I'm I'm moving out. I'm going to give you sixty days notice on the first. You know, if they're a good tenant, I might say, listen, you know, I'll give you five hundred dollars if you sign another year lease. I'll give you five hundred dollar bonus, or I'll buy you a new air conditioner for the living room, or some new ceiling fans. And a lot of times that works. So and if that's really smart because it's going to cost you more than four than five hundred dollars if she leaves, a, right? Oh, much more. You're going to lose yeah. a month's rent. You got to you know paint, carpet, whatever other fix ups you got to do. Yeah, it's, if they're a good tenant, it's, it's much better to pay them to stay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a really good idea. I think I'm going to steal that. That that's great. Well, Mark, tell us about your coaching program. You have a coaching program where you help investors uh, get started and, and grow their portfolio. T- tell us what you're doing. Yeah, I do. Actually, I just started it uh, a few months ago, like formally. 
Uh, it's really it's just customized. It's uh, by the hour. There's no commitments. There's no contracts. You know, I'm not. You don't have to sign a contract to give me half the money for your first ten deals or over the next five years or anything like that. It's just by the hour. Uh, you can go to markowens.com for a little bit of details. That website is horrible. Uh, yeah, I made it with Word. It looks like something from 1994. <laughs> if, if you've been on the internet that long, I'm in the process yep. of having somebody else put it together. But that's like it's back burner stuff. Uh, I'll get around to it eventually. But uh, that's one place where people can go to get a little bit more information about what I do, and and then they can determine whether or not. Uh, you know, they want me to help them. Awesome. Well, I will go ahead and put a link to your website on my website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 118. And I'll also go ahead and put a link to the master key set that you use. Uh, again, that's rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 118. Well, Dan, listen, thanks for having me. Um, there, are, there are just a few things that I would like to you know, uh, say to your audience before we drop off. Uh, one of those things are, you know, time is your most valuable asset. Don't waste it. Uh, get rid of your television. You know, there, there's just, there's too much other good stuff in your life to waste your time with things that aren't productive. So time's your most valuable asset. Your second most valuable asset is going to be your reputation. Uh, you're going to want to, you know, do everything you say you're going to do. Don't BS people. Don't play games. You know, uh, your reputation is going to accelerate your growth tremendously. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, the networking portion is another huge part of this business. Get out, talk to people, invite people out to lunch, go to RIAs, go to meetups, and ignore the naysayers because you're going to have a lot of people in your life that are going to tell you, well, you know, my uncle did investing in the 1970s and he lost everything. <laughs> well, maybe he did, but uh, I wouldn't use somebody else's failure as any kind of uh, guide for what is possible for you. There are far more people that are doing well in this business than have failed at it. But the thing, but it takes work. It's not, it's not like the TV commercials where you're just sitting on a yacht in the Caribbean, you know, getting paid. It, in the beginning, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's like that for me now sometimes. But in the beginning, it's a lot of hard work. And if you put the work in and uh, you don't waste your time, you keep a good reputation, you, you know, and you start talking to people, then it's really anything is possible. I'm far more. I'm a lot further into this business than I ever thought I would be, than I ever dreamed of being. Uh, again, it just started out as a way to just kind of protect myself in the events that something bad happened to me. And then as I got more comfortable in the business, I saw it as a step to freedom, a step of you know getting out of the rat race and, uh, and making my income schedule work around my personal schedule instead of the other way around. And those are just some of the things that I wanted to leave off with, Dan. Thanks again for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on, Mark. And we'll be back next Tuesday with another interview. And next week, we're going to talk to an investor that is also crazy successful, but he has a totally different approach. He's investing for appreciation. So it'll be interesting to compare what he's doing with what Mark's doing. So we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.